So we start. So first of all, thank you very much for being here. Um, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club, and uh, I'm really pleased uh, to have this uh, special event uh, this night with uh, these really special people. And uh, personally, I was really looking forward to that, so I also feel a bit excited. <laughs> uh, but okay, it's part of life. And um, first of all, I wanted to introduce a bit uh, what we do here for the people that uh, are not been uh, at our events before. As I say, we are part of the Disruption Network Club, that is a team uh, of three women. So together with me, there are also other two wonderful women working. Uh, one is uh, Kim Foss, uh, and uh, the other is Daniela Silvestrin. And uh, we are founded by the Hauptstadt Kultura Fonds Berlin, and uh, we have a main cooperation with uh, uh, Stefan Bauer at the Kunst and Kreuzberg Betania, and that is the institution downstairs. And actually, I also invite you to their opening that will be immediately after this event. So if you want to join uh, also their event, you are totally welcome. And uh, for this specific initiative, we have also uh, two great uh, cooperation partnership. Uh, one is uh, with the Nome Gallery, uh, directed by Luca Barbeni, and the other is uh, with the Spectrum, uh, an independent space that is working on art, science, and hacking in Berlin, Kreuzberg. Uh, then I'm going also in detail to explain which kind of cooperation we have with them for this event. And uh, uh, also I would like uh, to thank the Office of Quebec in Berlin, especially for the panel of tomorrow, because they supported the coming of Sophie Tupin, that will be one of the speakers of the panel uh, of, of tomorrow. And um, so the title of our event is Summit Data, Tactics and Strategies for Resistance. And uh, as usual, what we do at the Disruption Network Lab is to always bring together different uh, expertise and also different people that have uh, uh, paths that uh, often intercross, uh, but uh, not uh, always, and so uh, we really want uh, often to have the challenge to bring these people together. So in this case, uh, uh, we will have a researcher, uh, journalist, uh, artist, uh, hackers, uh, and also a whistleblower. And uh, in this specific event, I have uh, here close to me uh, Jacob Applebaum, Teresa Zucker, and Laura Poitras. And so I want just to... Uh, in, present them briefly and then we go into the details of these events. I mean, I think many of you know them already, so maybe I'm just redundant, but I usually do that so when I introduce the events, so I also want to do it with you. Uh, so, Jake Applebaum is a journalist, an artist and researcher, and uh, he also defined himself a post-national independent uh, computer security researcher, and I really like this post-national part. Um, and uh, I also like the part that uh, now we can totally define him as an artist after the wonderful opening of yesterday. <laughs> Actually, we could already define him before, but uh, I even read that today there was an article about you like the artist of the week. So <laughs> I think it's really great that, you know, we manage also to do that. Um, and uh, um, Laura Poitras, also many of you know, she's an academic award-winning filmmaker and also journalist. She won the Best Documentary Academy Award for the film Citizen Four, but also she did a wonderful film documentary before, uh, all about uh, um, the post-9-11 uh, issue. And uh, by the way, today is also September 11, so I think that this panel is uh, uh, happening in a really <laughs> crucial moment, so maybe we should think about that. And uh, Laura is also the co-founder of The Intercept, together with uh, Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill. And at the moment, she's also preparing a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art that will open uh, next uh, February. 
And Teresa Zucker um, is a researcher on uh, civil disobedience, and she is uh, um, working on global constitutionalism and the internet at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And uh, her PhD is uh, at the Humboldt University and concern digital civil disobedience. So I think that we have a really great uh, combination here. And uh, now I would like to enter a bit more into the detail of uh, this event, actually explain you why we call it uh, Summit Data Evidence for Conspiracy. So here I also want to connect with one of the par partnership that we were mentioning before, uh, that is the partnership with the Nome Gallery. And yesterday we opened the uh, Jay Kappelbaum solo show that had the same title, uh, Summit's Data Evidence of Conspiracy. And uh, this shows, uh, then I want to go a bit more into detail of that. And, uh, and so I'm happy that Jake allowed me to because <laughs> we had a long conversation about that. He was uh, saying, no, I don't want to speak about my art because this panel is about more important issues. But uh, I also think that uh, your art is an important issue and it's also speaking about important issue. So I'm happy also to share this experience. And uh, it's uh, a show that had the six, I uh, have actually, because it's still going on, just open and will be going on until October 31st. It's a show of six Sibacron uh, prints and two installation projects that are related to the Snowden affair, but also really go beyond that. And then we will explain why. And so in these two days, so we start with this first panel, the Summit Zata Evidence of Conspiracy, and then the second panel tomorrow will be also called Summit Data, but uh, we'll have the subtitle Strategy for Resistance. And this is important, I just wanted to mention both the panel because we sought to start uh, uh, first with a uh, panel that is also related to this course of whistleblowing and the struggle of, uh, for a universal human rights and social justice. But we also want to open the discussion to political practices and try to understand actually how whistleblowing could be interpreted as a form of uh, politics, but also uh, in which way is connected with artistic practices and also with civil disobedience. And maybe I should also explain you why we have the title Summit's Data. And uh, Summit's Data is actually coming from a Russian word that is a Summit's Data. I mean, I'm not Russian, even if my name is Russian, I have nothing to do with that. But I try to uh, explain a bit in the sense that uh, uh, the definition of Summit's Data actually comes from Sam and its that. So Sam means self and it's that means uh, publishing house, so some it's that means self-published. And they refer to a grassroots network of practice in the Soviet Union that took place uh, uh, from uh, the late 50, and there was uh, a grassroots network of people that were exchanging hand-to-hand -hand, uh, secrets uh, and also sensitive information, also to circumvent censorship. So actually Jake had the idea of uh uh, connect the discourse of Summit's data to Summit's data, so it's not his definition, but uh, it's his idea to connect to the show. And I think really um, connects totally well if you also want to open the discourse of surveillance, whistleblowing uh, into the digital realm, so Summit's data. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, I would like now to enter into the specific of the show because it could be also uh, an input to open up our discussion and actually our um, idea to have this uh, specific work into an artistic context is also because we, want to, we wanted to create a shift uh, of knowledge and also try to have uh, um, the debate about surveillance and whistleblowing uh, in a cultural uh, uh, situation because also in that way of course the uh, uh, perception of the subject changes and you can also open up to many other reflections that uh, uh, are related to the 
public in general, so not only actually the people that work in specific uh, um, governmental agency, but actually the every one uh, person. And so this is also a lot about our panel and about the show that is not about heroes, but is about uh, normal people. So now I want to ask <laughs> Jake if uh, he can tell us more about this show. And also I would be really interested if you would explain the public which kind of technique you are using that is the in color infrared photography that really connects with the discourse of surveillance and also uh, the special aesthetic connected to the Seabach room print. And then I think from that we can open up to the content of the show itself. Um, sure. Um, thank you very much for that incredibly great introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable to talk about the art that we showed yesterday just because I just I usually spend my time talking about anonymity and about technology. Uh, it's just strange to talk about art that I made originally in a sort of more private uh, setting. I mean, making portraiture like this portraiture with color infrared film is something that I've been doing for the better part of a decade. Um, mostly I, I, I use the color infrared uh, film stock, which is not produced anymore. and the film that, that I actually shot these photos with is cut down from a 70 millimeter uh, Kodak infrared film stock by a person in Munich uh, by the a name, uh, Dean I think is his name. He was supposed to come last night, but I don't think that he did. Um, but he, I think was even sued by Kodak for remaking this film into a different uh, size um, because they wanted him to say that it was a used film now that he had tampered with it and so on. Um, but it was originally used for agricultural surveillance and a few other different mediums. And um, this, this uh, film is essentially no longer produced. It's uh, basically completely difficult to get. He's actually the last person in the world that actually still sells this film. Um, and uh, for the most part, the, the film, it, it takes the, the ultraviolet and the near infrared and the far infrared spectrum and it actually compresses this information down into the visible light spectrum and then it falsely colorizes that information. Um, and this means that you can see extra details you might not otherwise see. If you, if you uh, photograph a forest, for example, and there's some... We have two photos on the back, so... Neither of those show what I'm going to explain, but... Um, <laughs> If you were to photograph a forest and you were to have a military convoy, let's say in the Vietnam War, um, right, or the American War in Vietnam, if you will, um, if you were to look then at this forest, you would see potentially a military convoy, even though it looks like plants because of camouflage, it actually would show on the film as being different because the plants have a particular chemical composition and the film reacts to that differently. And so things would sort of pop out. You literally would be able to see things that you would not otherwise be able to see. And uh, I'm really a big fan of hallucinogenics, so I like to make photographs that remind me of, um, of that. And so I like psychedelic colors. I think they're really fantastic and this film, helps you to see things differently and it helps you literally in some cases to see vein structures underneath skin in a really clear way that you might not otherwise. Um, and so it, it, it's not surreal because actually it's reality that we see there. Um, but I very much like this idea of having in my photographs that I give to other people something that is a long process. So it takes a while to get the film, then the film has to be remade, then it has to be shot, uh, then it has to be processed. And then I'm really slow at scanning. In fact, I usually don't scan. And then it takes even longer to print. And the printing process for the show that we did last night is very special. There's only a few people that still print with Cibachrome. And um, um, the really wonderful Barrett Gilma, who assisted us for the show, actually found one of the last Cibachrome printers alive. And he's in Los Angeles. His name is Frank. He's a really fantastically friendly person. And uh, he made these prints, which I feel were the exact a perfect printing technique for this extremely rare, kind of bizarre photographic technique. Um, and so the, the, the overall result of this is that you have, um, especially in the show last night, pictures which are extremely sensitive to red. So the, the Cibachrome process is very sensitive to any exposure to red, which means that it's actually, if you look at the slides themselves, they actually have significantly more detail and they're very um, fine. You can see this in the digital photos, the way that the trees in the back with Glenn and David here uh, have some extra details. On Cibachrome, it actually starts to bleed through and that's a sort of, um, it's sort of a, one of the 
not great things about CB Chrome for most people, but I actually really like that, the way that it sort of fades into like blocks of color. Um, but, the, but depending on how you were to expose this, if you were to do a C print, for example, you'd have much more detail in the CB Chrome. Is, uh, significantly less precise, let's say, and I feel like that's nice. And of course, it, it, it is sort of an accident of history uh, that we um, find ourselves taking pictures, or I find myself taking pictures of people that work on surveillance issues with a surveillance film. Um, when I first started shooting this film 10 years ago, well, I was obviously interested in that, and I'd been working on the tour project already at that point, um, it was not actually the case that I had consciously thought I would have a show about people that would reveal mass surveillance. Uh, that just kind of happened. So like great things in art, I think it's important to say that that was an accident and I'm happy that it pays off now. Um, but really it was not on purpose. And um, yeah, so that, that technique is very rare. Um, and unfortunately there's about 100, maybe 200 rolls of this film left in the world, I think, of which half of it is in my fridge. Um, um, a really sad little sub-point about that is that, um, for example, uh, different governments purchased a lot of this film, and they actually just throw it away now. Um, so they have like, you know, millions of euros worth of this film, and they have switched to digital technologies, and so often they just throw it away. And Dean tries to find these uh, stocks of this film and then remake the film into something that can be shot by uh, medium format or large format cameras. And uh, he's, I guess, sort of found that it's not possible to find more of it anymore, which is really sad. So it's really a dying medium, which I think is fitting for taking portraits that I think may at some point be historical records. Like taking a picture of Laura during the summer of Snowden is, uh, I mean, it's a great honor to have been able to shoot that photograph. Uh, and I think it's great to do it with a film which in the future just won't exist anymore. Um, because the film and Laura are one and the same in this way. Like someday we'll all be dust. And so I'm glad that it could be used, like the last of that film could be used to take a photograph of Laura, for example. Yeah, and just I would like uh, if you briefly say what are actually the content of the show and so in which people did you want to portray it and uh, because I think what the show is really uh, telling us is also that it's not just uh, an exhibition about the specific photos as, uh, you know, an object uh, uh, itself, but it's also a show about the process of, uh, of networking. So you, we usually say that, uh, um, I mean, it's about also the people uh, that are portrayed, uh, that something like uh, there's no the revelation where possible. So it's something that led to that because there was a formation of people that got together doing that. So it's also about a specific network of trust. And I think, at least from my perspective, that that is the real artwork. I think the real artwork are also the connection between the people uh, that happened before and after the creation of the artwork itself, and so goes also beyond the object. And um, I think maybe it would be also interesting to see your perspective on that and in which way you think actually these are normal people and also if you could also say something about the installation because I think then we can connect in which way certain actions are possible and other instead are much more difficult if you are dealing with sensitive material. Sure, um, so the, the pictures in the show are in no particular order, but I guess in the order we put them in the gallery would be um, Glenn and David in um, the jungle outside of Rio de Janeiro near where they live, which is on the right. Which was, um, which was um, taken in 2012. Yeah, this is a photo, um, so before Edward Snowden was known to any of us, um, we took this photo. I mean, this is just a, I traveled a lot for the tour projects and I was in Brazil and I wanted to meet um, with Glenn about some things he was writing about. He was writing about WikiLeaks quite a lot um, during that time. And <clears throat> I, I very consciously with my photography tried to think about what I would like to promote. And so often when I take a portrait of someone, it's because I really appreciate them for something they've done. Maybe it's just existing, but there's something, something there. And, um, so, for example, I explained um, at the art opening or at the press preview, you know, I try not to take photos of people smoking, for example, because I don't want to encourage the youth to smoke cigarettes and I think it's terrible or, you know, like some kind of social responsibility. So this photo really represents something that I did want to promote, which is homosexuality. 
and in particular, like a really loving couple. And I just thought it was beautiful. I just really appreciated them. And at the time, I would have no idea that David Miranda would be held as a terrorist in, in, in the United Kingdom just a few years later while working with Glenn in journalistic enterprises. Um, so for me, it was a very uh, special photo, which I actually gave to them almost immediately. And very rarely, anyone who's ever been photographed by I me, mean, they know that this is an irritating fact, which is if I take your photo, I, you'll probably never see the photo. But if you do, it'll be like a really a long time later. Because um, I like to make sure that you build up so much expectation that then you really appreciate it when you've given up all hope that it will ever arrive. And then the photo arrives. Um, and that's not entirely conscious, it's also because I'm just really slow, but it's also sort of conscious. Um, the next photo, which is not uh, on the screen, is the picture of Laura uh, Poitras. Yeah, it's there. Okay, great. It's uh, up there in the upper right-hand corner. And this is a photo which, uh, essentially, I mean, we um, were working on various things um, over the last couple of years. This is a scene which I feel you could have seen many times with Laura, which is that she would be um, working really hard and then she would take a moment to, like, stretch or to lay down on her sofa. And it's just like a picture I had in my head for a really long time because I saw it over and over and over and over again. And then one day when she least expected it, I had my camera out and I said, hey, and she looked over and I took that photo. It was, a, it was a nice moment and I was very happy to have surveilled her in her own apartment after working so hard there to, to not surveil her in her own apartment. Um, and then from that photo over is a photo of Julian, which I very consciously chose. I have, a, I have a number of photographs of Julian from over the years, from really early WikiLeaks days until, uh, until the last couple of years where I haven't been able to travel to the United Kingdom. So I have some photos of him in the Ecuadorian embassy, but obviously he's been there for three years now. So um, this is a photo of him when he was, still on, he was still on house arrest. And he was able to leave, obviously, uh, every day from the, what we, we lovingly called the Bale Mansion, uh, Ellingham Hall, um, which is owned by some landed gentry in the United Kingdom. Everything that's wrong with the United Kingdom is featured in that sentence almost. Um, and he is wearing an ankle bracelet. You can't see it in this photo. Um, and he's actually talking to Laura. Nobody, I think, ever knew that. But um, we were shooting these photos. And um, I just in this moment, I wanted to have a photograph of him where he wasn't looking at me. And he was talking with Laura. And I think I shot this photo while they were in the middle of a conversation. I don't think he was very happy about it, actually, because he's very, like, he likes to be in control of things in a very particular way. And I say that in a loving overbearing Australian men or overbearing Australian men kind of way. Um, so I really like it though. And I like it in particular because he's young and he is fit and he looks like resolute and strong. And also it shows that he's kind of arrogant and a little bit of a politician and also that his like, you know, his will is not broken. And I wanted to show that as opposed to something uh, with him sitting in the embassy where he has been, you know, denied sunlight directly for three years. And I wanted to show him also, I really like this photo. There's a couple other ones that are similar to this, but this one has this really beautiful tree in the background um, where you get, because it's almost sunset when the photo is taken, you get um, this incredible set of colors that's extremely difficult to bring out with color infrared. Um, so I was very happy about that as well. Uh, and then in the show, um, the next photo is the one of Sarah. And this, this photo is uh, the only photo we shot for the show specifically. Um, and I, I wanted to show her not as Anton Corbin had shot her, who is my favorite photographer, basically, after maybe Laura and Trevor. Um, but Anton Corbin shot her in a leather jacket, looking kind of like Che Guevara, sort of, you know, but like the British woman who'd saved Snowden, and she's just like really like hard, you know, she's just like super, super hard. And I know her as a person who has a sort of variety of faces and she does an amazing number of different things. And so I wanted to show her more relaxed in her environment in Berlin. And so we went to a park and we shot this photo of her sitting this way and I thought it was nice and there's an accidental Jesus in the photo which you might be able to spot. Um, it's a little strange but on the upper right hand corner there's just like a thing that sort of multiple people pointed out to me looks like a crucifix which I thought was kind of hilarious and certainly unintentional. Um, so it's kind of like you know, unintentional religious symbology for, for uh, you know, uh, an angel of our time. Uh, I don't believe in God or any of that garbage at all, but nonetheless, 
art speaks to you in strange ways. So the next photo would be Bill Binney, which is, if we could go back, it's this one. It's actually the photo in the show that makes me the most emotional because, I, so I'm not a nationalist. I'm, I, you know, I think nationalism is a sickness that has unfortunately struck my country, the United States of America, in a really weird way, but I can't stop saying stuff like my country. So it's clearly still infected me and it really bothers me a lot. And it bothers me because of what I've seen happen to people like Bill Binney or to Laura or to other people that I know. But in this photo, Bill doesn't have legs. You wouldn't know that because he's standing, um, but that tells you something about his sort of will, his resolution to continue to stand. But in the last several years, the US government has harassed Bill Binney so heavily for actually being correct and doing the right thing. And I mean, he's a really by the book kind of guy. Um, but the, you know, the stress of that along with diabetes caused his legs to be amputated. This is a person who I feel has really suffered. And at every point he could have chosen to stop suffering. He could have chosen to capitulate. And he always refused. And so he's making a fist in this photograph. One of his shoes is untied. He's a little unkempt, but not too unkempt. And he has, you know, this resolution, he's standing in the dead of Berlin winter, also talking to Laura in this photo, I might add. And, um, and he's making a fist, and in the background you see his wheelchair. And I feel that it's a, a beautiful photograph of him. And it's how I will always remember Bill, which is that he stands tall no matter what is happening. He's a resolute, just completely awesome guy. And he's kind of like your crazy uncle that sends email forwards with like, you know, really ridiculous things with HTML emails and stuff. So he's also a really funny guy. And you see that in the smirk of his face in the photo as well, I feel. And it's just like when I was describing the photo during the press preview, I got kind of choked up about it because I feel that he has really unduly suffered uh, a great deal for revealing what now, thanks to Snowden, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, Laura published in the New York Times about the domestic surveillance program, which is the Fairview program. And he and I revealed the locations of a number of those interception points in 2011, I think it was, at the Whitney? It was 2012? 2012, yeah, in 2012. And everyone thought that we were all crazy people for talking about that. And we, we showed the locations and we talked about it. And really the Wall Street Journal, some New York Times people, they were there. They didn't write about it. They said we were crackpots and so on. And like, amazingly, despite that incredible degradation, he's just stuck by it and he still does to this day and that's really very powerful. And the final picture in the show is this one here which is way, way in a tree in Beijing. And I appreciate this very much in particular because it's one of the very rare moments you'll ever see Ai Weiwei without a cell phone. And um, that's really um, not an understatement. This is a man who part of his surveillance self-defense is to surveil himself all the time. Um, this is part of a strategy where he believes he's not doing something wrong, which is to say that surveillance is not actually, in his mind, about capturing, uh, for example, the rest of your life and chilling your speech, but it's about finding a specific bad action that you've done. And so if he were to document himself more fully, then people would see that he's, of course, innocent. But in my view, surveillance is about power, and I think that you don't gain any power by embracing it and doing the job of the oppressor for the oppressor. Uh, nonetheless, that's what he does, but in this photo there was a bit of a compromise and he actually put away his, his iPhone, which I was very happy about. And then there are two final pieces in the show. Um, one of them is Panda to Panda, which was uh, the little panda that's up in the right-hand corner. That is a little touch of our graphic <laughs> that yeah. decided to put it back there. Yeah, uh, so the panda, uh, we made 20 pandas stuffed with uh, shredded Snowden documents and other uh, related documents, uh, like European court rulings and so on. And um, then we put a small SD card inside of the back uh, left leg, I think it is. And uh, inside of this, um, we have some files on it. And then we have um, all these shredded documents surrounding it. And then we sewed them up. And these are pandas, which we just bought at a store. And we emptied them out um, of their stuffing and then restuffed them. And then we sent them around the world in a sort of clandestine peer-to-peer -peer way um, where everybody took a panda or two and smuggled them to different places. So like Laura has one in New York City. I think Glenn received one. And it's in Rio. I'm not entirely sure. I wasn't part of that 
section of the compartments. So I have no idea where they went. Um, but one was sent also to Julian in London, and then Sarah received one, and other people from the Chaos Computer Club who really helped with things relating to the Snowden affair um, or were very supportive of it. We wanted to sort of acknowledge their support. And these are not for sale. These were only given as tokens of appreciation for people who took really serious risks we felt, and they did it not for a reward. And so we, Weiwei and I wanted to give this as a reward. Um, he kept some material to make other ones, which I think is a pretty standard process. And then the final thing is um, this necklace, which was made um, with uh, Manuela from the gallery. And yeah, I guess they have those necklaces. Yeah, um, this is one of these necklaces. And um, this is a little bit different. Um, basically, this is filled with um, unreleased uh, documents or sometimes partially released documents or our journalistic notes, uh, maybe also a tax return, a utility bill, I don't know, there's all sorts of stuff in that paper shredder. And um, the basic idea behind it was to create a conversation piece where people can talk about the necessity of redaction or about how there are sometimes pressures that have nothing to do with safety but about political realities where there's guilt, shame, and fear around that process where even journalists working to expose secrets become complicit. So for example, the, the JPL kill lists that we released with Der Spiegel, when we released them with Der Spiegel, we had to redact the names. But of course, I also printed these lists and then looked through them because as part of doing the research, it was necessary to print them to be able to read them. And then of course, you know, shred these documents, like stir them up in a tub, you know, mix them in with other stuff. And it, it's just a very long, uh, it's a very long re uh, redaction process. And in the end, I was left with this garbage bag full of sensitive documents over the last two years. And so we thought, you know, rather than throw out this thing which is waste, which would also be a waste, we could turn it into a piece. And so we turned it into a piece where we made a hundred of them. And the idea here is actually that you're carrying around this uh, guilt and shame and fear, but you're also carrying around the unreleased Snowden documents in a form which is the only form you'll ever see them in until society itself creates the groundwork for more of those things to be released. For example, from the government rather than from the journalists. These pieces of information could be released if we build enough of a collective mass movement to demand that, I think. Um, so part of that was to try to create a piece where we could do that, and again, to make it a little bit differently than the Panda, where the Panda is publicly available documents, even though they're still classified. This is about information which is not released in full, um, that is still classified and is still secret, where I myself was complicit in that culture of secrecy. And so it's also a self-critique about my own failure as a journalist to release more information. And those are the pieces from the show, and I hope now that I can stop talking about my own art. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Now, I think it was important to have this uh, ground because uh, these pieces really open up a lot of issues. And um, so I also wanted to go back to the discourse of um, evidence of conspiracy that is the, the subtitle of this panel and also the title of the show, the subtitle of the show. And uh, in that sense, I also wanted to tell you a bit the genesis of this uh, specific panel and show that actually started, uh, at least among uh, me, Jake and Laura, like two years ago, when we were uh, preparing a panel at Transmediale Festival that was called Art as Evidence. And uh, that specific uh, night, also Jake had uh, some of his prints, uh, and uh, it was actually the night of my birthday, and he gave me as a gift uh, uh, the, the photos of Laura, and Laura was also there with us, and for me it was also really a special moment. And in that specific night, we were also discussing uh, on how to basically title that panel that then we did also with Trevor Pegley in was February 2014. And so Laura uh, came up with the idea of art as evidence. And also I want to say that uh, I think perhaps she is also the one to thank most for this show because I know that she has been really pushing Jake to show his photos for at least four years. <laughs> so I think that she is also really responsible of all of that happening. And uh, uh, that is also why we are here discussing together again. And, uh, I think that this definition, definition of art as evidence uh, 
um, is really crucial because uh, connects uh, uh, the artistic practice with the one of whistleblowing. And I think it's also really interesting because uh, uh, by doing that, then you can start to reflect on art as uh, a territory for opening up a, a critical perspective uh, also to generate evidence as an artistic strategy. And at the moment, uh, Laura is preparing actually a show at the Whitney uh, Museum. And uh, I also would like to ask her what, uh, in which way you would define art as evidence and how connect with the work you are doing right now. Yeah, um, first of all, I want to thank you, Tatiana, for organizing this. Um, I, I think that that title came out when we were talking about, about that panel, and it was my work, it was Trevor Peglin and, and Jake, and each of us um, in, our, in our practice do work that is engaging or in dialogue with the world, with the po political reality that we live in. And um, for me as an artist, I mean, the reason I make art is to say something, is to express something about the world. And so it's an active expression. And, uh, and I think that that's also true for all of our work, but it's not just any active expression, but what do you want to say about that? And I think that art opens up a space to talk about things in different types of ways, in emotional ways, in ways that are um, inform us and also move us. And, um, and so I would argue very much that actually Jake's work is not accidental at all. I mean, Jake, I mean, his, his photographs that document a culture for over the past decade are a document of people. It's not a coincidence that William Binney was um, interrogated, that Julian Assange has um, been in the embassy for three years, that Sarah Harrison can't go home, that I've been detained at the border 50 times, that Jake can't go home, and that Ai Weiwei didn't have his, I mean, didn't have a passport. I mean, that would be a pretty extraordinary coincidence, right? That, you know, if you were to look around the room, how many people would you put in that, that category? So I think that the work that Jake has been doing has been about representing for himself a culture in which he's very much a part of. And that's, to me, very, um, it's very powerful because it's very clear that he's not taking these photographs from an outside perspective, but from somebody who is of this community. And, um, and then in the work that I've been trying to do is basically trying to find ways to communicate about what I think is a really horrible chapter in the United States history, which we're now on an day of an anniversary of. And so what are the ways that we could get at these kinds of issues that we all know? I mean, you know, we can just do a sort of a reminder um, that Guantanamo opened in 2002 and that there are people there who've never been charged with anything. And, you know, the, where's the international pressure to close Guantanamo, you know, and, and so obviously that's the information itself isn't enough, right? So it, it's, it's not enough to sort of, um, I think, change the reality, but it's also not enough to actually say what, um, what that means. I mean, I don't think it's even, it's, I think it's actually incomprehensible to imagine being in a prison and never being charged with anything. I mean, and never know why you've been put there. So, so for me, I, I feel like that art is about creating this, a way to, to express something about the real world. I don't think it's something that's separate from political realities that we live in. I think it's very much um, that as artists, we're not separate from those political realities. We're just responding to them and we're um, uh, communicating about them. And I'd also take issue with Jake's um, argument that his work is to provoke because it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't add up because he didn't show the work for like a decade. So, so you're not promoting anything. Like, you're not promoting anything because nobody saw it for so long. So I think that there's probably another reason why you do what you do, and I don't think it's about promotion. Um, uh, what else? Your work at the moment? I mean, so, I mean, I, I can't seem to get away from these themes. So, um, so I did... I, finished a, a, a work that I called a trilogy about post 9-11 and now I'm doing something else and I can't sort of just like walk away and make something about, you know, uh, um, something that doesn't sort of occupy me or that's ongoing. And uh, the war, the US war on terror, war of terror, whatever you want to call it, is very much an ongoing thing. In fact, it's actually more frightening today than it was, I think, a decade ago. Because a decade ago you could say that we're in a moment of emergency and that things will roll back and now we're at a sort of state of metastasized and institutionalized um, extrajudicial extra um, actions. The drone war I think is one of the most frightening things that we've entered into into this sort of new chapter and I think uh, when 9-11 happened I think I, 
it, it would have been unimaginable that we would sort of be sitting here at a time where we, the governments are flying planes and assassinating people. I mean, that's how did, how did we sort of come to terms with that as a, an acceptable political reality? So, so, um, so the work that I'm doing is going to, you know, continue to, to um, deal with these things, but it's in a museum context. So instead of, um, my, my films tend to be narratives, so they tend to have um, protagonists and protagonists who go through th some sort of uh, uh, conflict, struggle, drama, and, and through that you sort of learn something about the reality. And, um, and in, in art context, this is going to be installation-based, so it will still be a narrative, but I think the, 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 it'll be the audience themselves that will be more the protagonist. And so there will be a beginning, middle, and end. Hopefully you will enter it with one state, state of mind and you'll exit it with another. Um, but it, it's not so much through um, a narrative of somebody outside. So for instance, Edward Snowden, is, as an audience member, you watch it and you sort of come to terms like, how did he make the decisions that he did and what are the consequences? And so you, there's this kind of empathy or um, relating to that other person. And so this will be a little bit of a shift in terms of I'm not asking, I'm not going to be asking the audience to empathize with necessarily another person, but more to sort of be in a more experiential, um, I guess, state of mind. Um, I think I lost my microphone, so it's a good time to stop. <laughs> okay. So then uh, um, I would like also to ask uh, something to Teresa, and I think there is a direct link here because we, you were also speaking about uh, how actually to make the audience participate directly into the context of these issues. And um, Teresa is doing a research that I think is really important because uh, she is connected the discourse of whistleblowing to the one of civil disobedience, so also giving a political perspective to all the matter. And I think this political perspective is really um, crucial because it's also what uh, perhaps uh, is still a bit missing, this is my perspective, because I think that, uh, of course, uh, there has been really a great uh, counter-reaction of many people that are working critically with technology, also um, generating uh, a lot of uh, important tools to circumvent and also to fight surveillance. People are doing crypto parties. But I also think that uh, it's important to have this reflection also in political terms. And in that sense also to try to reflect in which way all of us can feel empowered actually to make a change and also in the sense uh, reconnect to the discourse of Laura of how you make a change, what is the matter of accountability. And so this is also connected to the panel we will have tomorrow, but specifically I wanted to ask Teresa in which way she connects the discourse of whistleblowing with disobedience and how this is related to opening up political practice to a broader audience and also broader agency. Yes, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, I feel super honored to somehow contribute to this great exhibition and to this topic especially. And first I wanted to add something to what you described about this exhibition. Because when you hear the title, Evidence of Conspiracy, you could think that what you're seeing is the conspiracy, these people consp um, conspirating against the state. And I think that is a total misconception which was maybe wanted a little bit, this game. Um, but the point is that all these people who are, in, in fact, very special are showing their faces and are showing their faces in this very sensitive way, exposing so much on these pictures about them, telling us who they are and what they did. And um, for the other side, the state surveillance that they revealed, we still don't know so many things about this and we don't know who was planning that and actually that is the conspiracy against citizens that we are seeing the evidence of. So I just wanted to add that to uh, what you said. So um, how is whistleblowing connected to civil disobedience? Um, first of all, I would say not all types of whistleblowing have a connection to civil disobedience because there is actions like uh, in the US system, there is tax fraud that you can blow the whistle on and that is totally wanted by the system. But there is very political actions that I would connect to civil disobedience that I understand 
as an um, intentional act of break breaking the law, which is usually very principled and mostly collective to change some policy or change a law. And um, the, the thing is that probably whistleblowing will be the most important and powerful time of civil disobedience of our coming uh, centuries because we live in an information society where information and who has information about what is a very, yeah, very strong type of power. And to control that information is one of the most, impossible, most important politics that states are doing and also companies are doing. So um, we are having um, information asymmetry. There is a lot of information about uh, citizens that are gathered by states, that are as as accessible by um, companies. But on the other side, citizens have very little information about how they are surveilled and what information is public about them, so there's this asymmetry. And uh, breaking this asymmetry, asymmetry by whistleblowing is a very powerful political act that we're seeing. But in the history of civil disobedience, that changes a lot, and that is um, the, probably the thing why it is so frightening to our governments, and I want to point to three changes. The first thing is, usually civil disobedience has been something very physical and connected to the presence of a person. You sit somewhere and don't go away and put your body somewhere as a kind of very visible politics. And with um, digital whistleblowing, spreading information, getting it somewhere um, to, to a place that can publish that information safely is a completely non-physical practice. So that is just one thing that, for thinking about civil disobedience, makes it kind of maybe not intuitive to, to see it as civil disobedience. Um, but one even more imp important change is that um, usually civil disobedience was told to be something symbolic, an appeal to the public, to think about a certain political measurement again. But what whistleblowing does is it directly intervenes with politics. It changes something. It is a kind of epistemic disobedience because it changes what we know about politics. And that is a much more powerful thing in a way than to just say, okay, let's symbolically sit down somewhere to, to, let, to talk about something that we want to have changed. And the third thing is another asymmetry that is taking place, and that is that um, for the yeah, more traditional types of civil disobedience, the penalties haven't been that extreme as we're witnessing today for exposing information of that kind that is certainly valuable to the public, or in a lot of cases at least very valuable to the public, um, the penalties are extreme. And so these whistleblowers that we're seeing and all the people who made that possible are taking an enormous risk um, that is kind of a new level of what civil disobedience is. So I think it's a very important and probably most influential type of civil disobedience for the next centuries to come. Do you want us to comment on this? I agree. Okay, so I think uh, also I have actually another round of questions. Then I also would like to open up to the public. And uh, of course, feel free to disrupt my moderation if you also want to ask each other something. <laughs> and um, I think what you were saying is also connected to the discourse of the importance of making a choice. Um, you know, because by saying that the people are really making a courageous act that also changes the uh, rules, if you want, of uh, resistance, disobedience, and also political conflict, um, I think actually is an aspect that is really crucial. And I wanted to go back to a panel that you had um, uh, at the uh, Congress uh, in 2012, actually it was your keynote, that was called uh, Not in My Department. And I think it was really interesting that you were already speaking about this subject in December 2012. So somehow it was a way to opening up a discourse. And I think in this keynote, uh, uh, by saying Not in My Department, uh, 
then you were also totally reflecting on the discourse, how it's possible to make a choice of accountability and also how this choice uh, uh, can be actually open to normal people, to the everyday life. And uh, so I have a question to Laura again, because uh, um, speaking about choices, uh, there is this famous sentence of Snowden that says that uh, he didn't choose you, you choose yourself. And uh, um, I think that uh, um, I would be also interested in understanding in you choosing yourself, uh, what was the perception of this specific act of whistleblowing? Because in your film, something that I found really important in Citizen 4 is that uh, Snowden doesn't look like uh, um, a hero. I mean, of course, then many people perceive that like in that way, but it's a film really about a normal person that also looks uh, vulnerable in many situations. And uh, I really love that detail of when he's trying to go, when, when he has to go out of the hotel a room that is really a jump uh, in the darkness and is just looking at his hair. And I think that is really a met metaphor of somebody that is having, I mean, is a normal moment of life, but in a really crucial and special situation. So I also wanted to ask you that. I mean, it was also your intention to not to create the, the hero in your film, but really show the normality of whistleblowing the normality in the really special context. Okay. So, um, so first, in, in, in response to this, the impact of whistleblowers, I actually agree with everything you said in terms of the enormity of the change that is created and the fear that the state has. But I also think it's important to remember that this whistleblowing doesn't happen in a vacuum, that it's a, it's a symptom of a society, and it's a symptom, I would say. And, and you know, it's not a coincidence that um, these two whistleblowers are both um, that Manning and, and Edward Snowden are from the US and they both had witnessed what was going on that was not being revealed to the public. So I think they we're looking at um, symptoms of a society and they're responding to that. And yes, of course, I'm not gonna argue that, I mean, we know that the, the risks that they've both taken. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of Snowden particularly, there's actually a more interesting quote that's actually not in the film that he sent to me, which was he, right before I um, traveled to to meet him in Hong Kong, um, uh, it was about a week before, he had already, um, I learned later, he had already left, and he said, um, he said that the odds are against us, but odds never matter when you win. Which means, you know, it's a, it was a pretty you know, high stakes roll of, roll of, um, of the dice and, and risk taking, and, um, <laughs> And, um, and I think, I mean, I'm not interested, I don't, actually don't believe in heroes per se. I mean, I believe that people do heroic things and that people are defined by the things that they do. And absolutely, um, Edward Snowden did heroic things. And you know, so have a lot of other people, a lot of them that, that Jake has documented. Um, and, but, I, but I think that it's just not about, I mean, it's not our, we're not, we're not sitting here in this panel because you know, any of us are any more special than anyone else. We have witnessed a bit of history, and so we're talking about that. And, um, and I think that, but it's all about risk taking. I mean, that's the, I mean, I think that that's the sort of fundamental underlying thing that if you were to look at, you know, whistleblowing or um, uh, the publishing that Julian Assange, or that I did or that, that Glenn did, I mean, there was a high, there was a high risk level there. And, um, and so I think that that you know, has to be factored in, but it doesn't mean that we're any different than, than other people um, in, in terms of what we're capable of or what we're scared of or what makes us, um, you know, what moves us. It's, it's the same as everyone in this room. Yeah, um, I was just thinking that for me, I asked myself the question like, what makes these people on the pictures different? What choice did they make that maybe other people don't make? And one important point would be that they all be overcame the fear of isolation. And I think that is what a lot of whistleblowers are whist uh, That is very loud. <laughs> that is what a lot of whistleblowers are experiencing and fearing that they are singled out because they stand up for defending their opinion and fighting against something wrong. And I think before Snowden, especially in Germany, 
most people wouldn't know what whistleblowing is. So it's, it's really a new practice and it's still something that is combined I, I, I to... Wouldn't, I wouldn't really call it a practice. I mean, I don't think people blow the whistle and risk going to prison for the rest of their life to find a community. Like, I would argue that... To, to, to find, like, a network or... It's like, no, no, like I this think is, it's the yeah. opposite. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, they, they are single out everything. because yeah, of yeah. that. Yeah. And I think um, we as a society um, have to work on not making it such a heroic act to, to blow the whistle on something, but making it more normal and connecting to people that say, okay, there is something wrong, we should get together and do something about it, so that it is not these heroic figures that stick out and do something about it, but it becomes a more, yeah, more embedded practice in society to stick to, okay, we made a mistake here, or there's something going wrong here, and to be able to talk about that, because I think right now it is still a very high um, risk of being singled out and have, yeah, experiencing isolation in what you do. Jake, you want to add something? <laughs> Strange. <laughs> okay. So I ask you a question, and will be my last question to you, uh, because I also want to hear what the public uh, think about all of this. And I know that you were also having interesting conversation before this panel, you and Teresa. And uh, Teresa also was telling me um, that you were speaking about the discourse of the banality of evil being a, an expert of Anna Arendt. And so, like the banality of even evil, maybe you can explain better than me, uh, related to the discourse of doing the job, of serving the duty, and also basically obeying uh, the orders. Then you were then coming up with the definition of the banality of goods that is also related to, <laughs> uh, to the discourse of doing the right thing. And also perhaps that this right thing is also something that is not uh, heroic, uh, but it's also something that, uh, you know, people, uh, you should tell better, go. <laughs> it's your definition of mine. Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, we were drinking. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think, yeah, okay, so there's a lot to unpack to be able to explain that, and I want to be as brief as possible, so I'll try to be, be really brief. Basically, I feel structuralism is an important thing to consider. So we exist inside of structures, and in those structures, certain behaviors are encouraged. And uh, for example, it is encouraged for Laura and for Julian and for Glenn and myself that if you were to come with secret documents that we would do the right thing. And uh, in some way, we have this, like, it's concretized. That's, that's our role in the world now, and actually, we don't really have a choice about that, and it would be really destructive to ourselves, to our networks, to our friends, and to the values that we promote if we were to do anything other than that. Uh, so in that sense, I don't even believe I have free will anymore. I mean, obviously, I do have free will, but I don't really. Like, my natural inclinations, my networks themselves, they actually form the choices I'm able to make. Uh, much the same way that fascist societies, I think people still have responsibility inside of them, but the, the range of choices that they can make is really selected for them. Very rarely do people have a full range of everything that is possible. Very few people are at privilege. They're, like, at liberty to, to do that. And so I was sort of suggesting that what Snowden said was very insightful about you choosing yourself. Like you, you know, this, this is not, like, I, it's not my choice. I feel like there's some truth in that, right? I mean, Glenn found himself in a position where he was writing about drone strikes and about American assassinations and about civil liberties violations. And it's like, you know, there was almost no one other than Noam Chomsky in the United States who was an American citizen writing about those things. And so like, who was Snowden gonna go to? The New York Times, that's a joke. You know, the Washington Post, yeah, great idea. I mean, these are people who, you know, beat the drum for the Iraq war. So they're not going to be able to make a choice that's a good choice. They're, they're tied in with, in the case of the New York Times, there's a great movie called Media Stan. And in Media Stan, they actually have an interview with who was the editor of the New York Times um, during the period that the movie was made, and he sort of talked about how they got on the phone with the CIA every single day when they were clearing stories. I mean, like, you know who I've never called when working as a journalist? The CIA, 
right? But so at the same time, they did that because that's the structure that they're a part of, and that, that that editor found himself in. And so this idea of the banality of good is just to sort of suggest that there are some structures in which the emergent phenomenon is this, what we're calling good behavior, and that there is some responsibility for it. But like, I don't believe in the, the narrative of the hero. I think, for example, Julian, what he's put himself into, he's, he is a document leaker for the rest of his life. He would have to work very, very hard to change that. And the work where he's revealing some injustices, that, that's a product of the structures and the people that he's brought around him in his life. And the same is true when you're a documentary filmmaker or when you're a journalist working with people, and those are the sources you have, and where you, where you think about um, human rights as one of the primary drivers. And so in some ways I feel like you, you end up being a, a part of a train that has this kinetic energy and you really don't have a free range of motion and you really do lose some sort of free will. And I think it's a theory that's difficult to expand on more than that because as I said, we started it by having a dinner discussion while drinking. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. You want to add something? I mean, it's somewhat related um, in terms of this narrative of, of, of good. I mean, one of the most, um, I mean, how the mainstream media has responded both to the, the first, the, the, the leaks, um, um, the war logs and the cables, and then with the Snowden um, disclosures. And one of the things that was really shocking is, is how they were sort of put in this sort of comparative, like what is good leaking and what is bad, rather than looking at what are they revealing about our societies that is wrong, which is the case in both. And like how this sort of framing happens around, you know, what, what types of actions, which I think um, somewhat echoes what what Jake is saying in terms of how um, you know we're doing this work and that there's there's the um, what we feel is whatever responsibilities we feel in terms of um, uh, publishing, but then also what is being sort of how is it being narrated in the larger sense? And I think that um, you know that is it 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 does actually. Um, can uh, shift like how, what the public perception is. So for instance, um, I mean, I think one of the most, um, it, uh, what, what was revealed by the war logs and uh, in terms of what was happening in the Iraq war was the most, I mean, it was, the, it was like lifting um, the, you know, the, or pulling the curtain back of like really what, the, what, what was happening um, uh, in, in, that occupation, and yet we sort of then start to the, the, the dialogue shifts, and then and then what happened when we started publishing, and how then the people did this comparison between the two, which I find is really destructive. Actually, uh, just as a, a thought about Bill Binney in particular, um, Bill Binney. I, I mean, I think of him as a kind of a person who's done some heroic acts, but I kind of feel like Bill Binney's uh, view of the world is shaped by an, an American indoctrination about superiority about America. It's not like, it's been said by someone, I don't remember who said it, America is the greatest country in the world, but it's not just the greatest country in the world, it's the greatest country that has ever existed in the world. Uh, and this is like this the really perverted viewpoint about the Constitution and about nation states. And I sort of feel like with Binney, he really started to talk about what he saw and he thought it was wrong because he'd basically been indoctrinated under one system. And then we had a switch to a different system. And in the first system, American citizens were treated as special and the rest of you were not. And then in the second system, none of us were special. And in my mind, that follows, right? There are some people that are treated as subhuman. In the end, everyone is treated as subhuman. That's a pretty straightforward, but Binney wanted to blow the whistle about that. But in some strange way, there was a, a whole lifetime of work where he didn't blow the whistle on this because it wasn't happening to Americans. And I think that that uh, tells you something about how once he started to do the right thing, he had sort of looked the wrong way for a very long time until just a sort of an arbitrary programmed feeling um, was bypassed. I mean, um, he could have been raised uh, with a so, sort of different set of ideals and he wouldn't have tripped that way. I mean, part of it is that there was a revolution in the United States, uh, I think, um, and that revolution was one where we went from a constitutional republic with the rule of law to one where we had secret interpretations and secret courts, and it really changed. And so what Bill Binney is is not a revolutionary. What Laura and Glenn and Snowden and Julian, they're not revolutionaries, they're counter-revolutionaries where they're fighting for like the most basic principles. And I mean, it's like a long discussion, this counter-revolutionary theory that I've been sort of thinking about for a while. But what, what Benny did here is to push against a tide 
um, where the original structure actually encouraged him to push against that tide. And I mean, he does have free will, he did stand up, he did suffer greatly for that. And at the same time, I almost feel that it's predictable that in a system with thousands of people indoctrinated in this really sick nationalistic way, that a few of them are gonna stand up about it. It just, it seems that's, that's always the case. And, uh, and we should honor them for having done that, but we should also remember that that's, I think, an emergent phenomenon as much as it is an individual action. I want to add something to that because um, two days ago when you were talking about Binny in the exhibition, you said something that made me think. Um, and you said that Binny was probably the one making Snowden possible. Without Binny, there probably wouldn't have been a Snowden. And I was thinking, yeah, and for Binny, probably there must have been some other person and some other principled person that gave him this, this example of how you can do this and how you can stand up against, um, against this uh, surveillance that, was, that is happening. Um, and so I thought that, you know, probably people think, you know, yeah, I'm not related to that practice. I, I, I'm not related to surveillance at all in my life. But I think it's more a cultural thing that in so many... Um, fields of our society, it's so much easier to avoid conflict and to just stay under the radar even you know, when you know that things are going wrong. Like everyone, like I can ask myself, everybody can ask themselves how many times have I not complained when I really realize that something is going utterly wrong. And I think, at least for myself, I know that a lot of times I didn't speak up. And I think that's a cultural thing not only a German thing, probably much wider than that, that we avoid conflict and we create a culture of dishonesty. And to break that is a hard thing. So we need more people who do that to make that a very common practice to, to speak about these things going wrong. Yeah, and also think that this relates to the discourse of accountability and when is the moment to make a choice. And uh, I was always reflecting also about uh, your work, Jake, and the one of Laura, because of course, uh, especially Laura and also Glenn really got a big responsibility there, also in understanding when is the moment to reveal certain facts or not. So, I mean, I totally agree that also this is really crucial on your work and uh, but I also think that, you know, at the end should not be only your responsibility because, of course, you end up of having, you know, information that are sensitive. But I think also the challenge, challenge here should be that the responsibility is something shared. So it's not only yours, but it's also the one of basically all of us. And uh, so I totally agree with what you are saying, Teresa, because I think for me the challenge would be how to share the responsibility, how it's possible also to open up this discourse into something that belongs to everybody. And in that sense, it's not only related to few people that have certain data, but also um, in a way that so you behave uh, by making a certain action of disobedience possible. And I'm also referring to an interview that actually Jorgen Johansson did with Ex Berliner. Uh, he will be speaking tomorrow, and I think it's going to be also really interesting. I don't want to you know, speak now about that, because he will do by himself. But also what uh, he was saying is really that uh, our choices may be to you know, allowed that people that want to make resistance and also provoke a reaction is actually possible. And I think in that sense you open up the discourse really a lot, because then uh, what is your responsibility in making possible that also certain people can take some choices? And in that sense also, I think that uh, the choice that Snowden uh, took is also because be people before, for example, like Bini or Ellsberg or other whistleblowers before, did that choice. So now I open the discussion to the public. <laughs> or I don't know if you want to comment further. I would just yeah. say, I mean, I think that this, this question, I mean, I think that, that um, 
I, I very much, you know, um, I think it's a very justified criticism just in terms of the, how to scale the, the reporting and, it's, um, and it certainly has been a challenge, but it's also this kind of, how do you build the sort of relationships and networks of trust and, 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 and they, they have been hard to, to, to balance and, um, and so, but I think it's actually a very valid criticism. So now it's up to you. Yeah, hello. My name is Daniel and I'm working with the German Whistleblower Network. Um, I think the best thing we can do to support whistleblowers is to transport to society that uh, whistleblowers are not jerks and not uh, traitors, but that they are experts of their own organization. Um, when I compare the whistleblowers, I see um, in the cases we treated or we uh, investigated, um, they all shared that they uh, shared the values of their system, of their organization at a very intense and high point. They were experts, they were totally supporting their company or their organization. And so they are the first ones to see when the organization itself gets in conflict with their own values. and. Uh, they start to blow the whistle when uh, looking into the mirror is not possible anymore. In my case, it was like this. Um, not blowing the whistle uh, would have made it uh, yeah, impossible for me to look in the mirror anymore. And uh, this was the reason why I decided, okay, I have to change something about the stuff I witnessed. And uh, if we can transport to society that uh, these people who uh, so highly offend uh, the company, the organization, and they, uh, which the whistleblowers then start to fight are the real problem. Um, then I think we uh, can change something and can say, okay, whistleblowing has a value not only for society, but also for companies because uh, the, the people who try to hide stuff and to uh, keep it away from the public, they really uh, harm their own company. So. Uh, this, this is my view on this. Um, I don't know whether you can agree to this, but uh, I think... I, I think it's more of a statement than a question, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Which is fine. I mean, but I think that's, let's move on to a question. I, I didn't see the, the, the personal uh, aspect of whistleblowing so much in the discussion. That's that probably it, true. Um, I mean, none of us are... I, I don't consider myself a whistleblower. I mean, I would say that I agree. I mean, it, I would take it as a statement, not as a question, and I'm, it's nice to see you here, by the way. Um, and this guy's done some really interesting stuff with his life, and so I, I would wanna honor what you've said and just say I would agree that, that generally speaking, whistleblowers are experts. For example, Daniel Ellsberg worked at the Rand Corporation. This guy's as far from being a hippie as you can imagine during the Vietnam War. And um, you know he saw things going wrong. He worked with McNamara directly, and he blew the whistle on this, and was called all of the things we've heard Snowden called, and then some. But it's important to recognize what he is: is he was a military analyst who really understood what was going on, and he was then vilified by all of his previous coworkers because he dared to tell other people what was happening in his in-group to the out-group, and the out-group was all of society. And it's important to recognize that that's what's happening here is there's this political tent, and there's some people that are in that political tent together, and when someone goes out of that tent, the tent tries to discredit them and demoralize them and harm them in every way. And that, uh, you see that actually with journalists also. Journalists like to talk about how other people aren't journalists as a way to push them out of the tent. Uh, it's really actually quite amazing when you see people do that because it's like one of, it's an unregulated profession, so it's really like hilarious to watch people stab each other in the back like that. It just tells you a lot about them. <clears throat> but I just wanted to say that I agree with that. So, but if there's a question, we'd love to take one. Yeah, um, it was interesting. We were talking about being counter revolutionaries. Um, Maybe I can ask a little bit about uh, this kind of American neurosis that we believe we come from a country with kind of personal liberties and you know that makes us special when I think even from going back to the time of uh, the second presidency there have been really strong restrictions on personal freedoms and uh, you know I can think of stories I've heard from my parents and their generation of the 50s and 60s, I mean, one could really talk about a good part of the 20th century as the reign of J. Edgar Hoover, uh, you know, and certainly if you were left-wing or you were for civil rights, you didn't have really liberties or privacy. 
uh, if anything, maybe the time from 1973 to 2001 is kind of the American equivalent of a, the Khrushchevian uh, thaw, like what was happening in the Soviet Union in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and maybe it also puts, a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting to think about maybe this, we were kind of brought up with this idea, this kind of lie about our societies. Uh, uh, so I would kind of say it wasn't, you know, the 73 to 2001, which is also not a pure period, but was really an exception. Uh, also, maybe the Ai Weiwei thing, you were talking, kind of criticizing him uh, for wanting to survey himself. But I was thinking, he's in a society that, where there isn't that illusion of freedom or privacy. And the one interesting thing I think he did at one point when he was in house arrest is he uh, put all his surveillance online and that really pissed off the Chinese government. I mean, they, they threatened to, if he didn't knock it off, they would uh, cut off his internet access. Uh, so in a way, he actually managed to shame the powers that be. I mean, I agree. Um, uh, I mean, it's a country, you know, the U U.S. is founded on slavery and, you know, killing of a population. I mean, so, yes, it goes way, way back. It's not like this is new. But I do think that there are things that are worth still pointing out. We can't, just by saying, like, well, this is, we've been doing this for a long time means we should, well, then, then what? So I do think that we still have to engage or respond to the realities that we're in. And, and I do think as an American that when legal documents are being written to legalize torture, we, we really should be appalled. I mean, that is shocking to me. And, and even though, yes, we, this is a country based that, on slavery. Yeah, I mean, we should be appalled just as Solzhenitsyn was appalled at the Gulag Archipelago. I just wanted to break the illusion that there was some moment of freedom, uh, you know, or some moment of, of civil liberties because I, I would say from the beginning of the Republic, they've been an illusion. Sure. Doesn't I mean, mean I, I mean, speak absolutely. out against the tyranny yeah, quite yeah, yeah. the I mean, more, I just, so. uh, there's a new film um, about the Black Panthers and you can see what they did to, you know, this is, you know, what happened in that case of, of um, a group of people who organized. I mean, it's, it's, it's not new, I agree, but it does have it, different iterations and I do think you have to respond to different iterations. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm Myself, Julian Assange, probably Sarah Harrison, and a bunch of other people were being investigated under a law that's called the Espionage Act. And this is, originally was brought in to um, crush dissent to the First World War. It was used against Emma Goldman, one of, the, one of my favorite anarchists of all time. It's kind of like both a tragedy and, uh, and an honor to be uh, you know, uh, investigated under the same law as one that Emma Goldman was investigated under. So you know, it's like a dubious badge of honor if there ever was one. But, um, I agree. I mean, I, I grew up um, in the United States in the 80s and the 90s uh, under the war on drugs. And um, my experience growing up with parents who used drugs was that uh, we were treated as like subhuman people as part of a massive class war. And so I never had the illusion that, you know, the world ended on 9-11 or something, right? I mean, my, you know, like reading Howard Zinn when I was, I don't know, in like high school or something, like I never had this like this theory that about America like that, which actually I think sets me apart from a lot of Americans, because I think a lot of people do believe that, unless they're people of color uh, or women. But generally speaking, lots of white men do believe the illusion. And, um, and uh, I mean, I think it's important that we should deconstruct that. But at the same time, there are privileges that have existed for people. They're just not equally distributed. And there is definitely, there definitely is some freedom, and, and that does exist, and we should work to expand it. And my point about Weiwei wasn't actually a critique on Weiwei doing those things. I actually think that that's a coping mechanism. Um, but what that coping mechanism does is it helps an individual. It does not change a structural reality. So for example, by surveilling yourself all the time, um, you're neglecting the fact that the purpose of surveillance is in fact to catch you doing things that are not a problem, such that the record exists and can be used against you later when it is useful. Right, it's uh, Cardinal Richelieu, if you give me six uh, lines written by the hand of the most honest of men, I'll give you something by which to hang him. So when Weiwei is doing this, it's true that he was able to shame the government to a degree, but it also took him four years with those tactics to get a passport back. And one might argue that what eventually did that was pressure from the West, not from him surveilling himself. So my worry is that we actually end up normalizing all of the surveillance and we, don't, we really don't make it better in a structural sense for anyone, let alone for Weiwei. He, eventually, he did get his passport back. Um, but the surveillance, the, the, the surveillance aspect of that, I think, is just one aspect of this broader political struggle. And it's not that in China you don't have any privacy. I mean, that's also like, I think that that's, a, that's incorrect to, to say. Um, it is the case that there's uh, 
in his case, you know, these cameras all around his compound, uh, police uh, presence in a building across the street and so on, and they invite him to lunches and then they want to talk to him about his behavior and so on. Um, it's, uh, it's an extremely oppressive thing for him. It was really terrible actually to see this, to watch that take place. Um, but it's also not clear to me that the, that surveillance strategy will make it better for an average Chinese person who's also subject to the Golden Shield Project, which is sponsored by Cisco and other American corporations. Right? It's, it's like, uh, for me, my, my, my concern there is that uh, we need to work on actually liberating everybody. And in order to do that, we actually have to think about systemic change. And so for me, what, I would, uh, what I've been thinking about doing is actually studying about South African liberation, starting with Saul Platt all the way until now, um, especially, especially the work of Tim Jenkins. And so uh, for basically you know, 100 years, there was a struggle on how did they overcome you know, the apartheid regime. And I feel like if you, if you look at the whole structural change, you'll find that these individual actions are important, but you need to have a, a much broader vision for that. You need to actually work towards very specific things. And whistleblowing is a tactic towards a particular goal often. But it's not, it's not a whole strategy in itself. We have to have many different strategies for that. And if we read uh, about South Africa, and I think Sophie is gonna talk about this tomorrow, so I won't like try to, try to scoop her about it. Um, but if we read about South Africa, you'll see that they had many campaigns. And I think if we want to create systemic change, especially about injustices, like let's say about mass surveillance or about drone strikes or something like this, or about the fact that the German government doesn't enforce German law on Americans because Americans in a real politic sense can do whatever they want, uh, to, even on German soil. Um, I think that we'll find that um, whistleblowing just isn't enough on its own. Uh, and also reminding Americans that we were never free is not really enough on its own. Uh, like it, these things are lacking and writing a book or making a film or showing some photos is not enough on its own. But if we can find enough of the areas, uh, you know, the, the sort of like the terrain of struggle, if we can find the terrains of struggle and then find the asymmetric advantages, I think we'll be able to make some differences on those trains of struggle. Um, but it is not entirely clear to me where all those trains of struggle are in an information society. And whistleblowing is definitely very powerful and as, a, as a, a tactic in this terrain of struggle for an information society. But I think we have to be much more systemic about our critiques and we have to really try to imagine how the structures work and then how we might disrupt the structures. And I think uh, that takes a whole, bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of thought that it's much, it's much broader than just a single tactic. It was really long, I'm sorry about that. So somebody of you want to add something? No. Other, yes, over there. Um, th this question kind of relates to the range of perspectives that we're usually getting when we're talking about this kind of resistance in journalism and now, now kind of on the spectrum of the arts. Um, and I, I really can't imagine the amount of pressure that you all are under by, for doing this, this great work that you do. And I, the question kind of relates though, if, would it put you under even more too extreme pressure to try to find ways to collaborate with uh, say people from Islamic cultures so we could hear the voices from the, the, um, the real victims of the war on terror or you know, someone like Nafiz Ahmed who has been fired from The Guardian for reporting on uh, sort of oil and, and sea rights of the, the Gazans. And so using um, these kinds of platforms to give voice to these people who have even less um, access to the media, would that be a very difficult thing to do in Germany to try to collaborate with people who are suffering maybe even more um, repression to get their voice out there? I mean, I don't, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, again, like I agree with the sentiment very much. I mean, I made a film about Iraq and it was about Iraqis and I was, I actually am not in that film because very much I didn't want it to be, the, the, the audience was thinking about me. I wanted them to think about the, the people who were in Iraq. And so I think, yeah, I, 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 I totally support that we need to, what you know, Jake said, we need to have sort of expanded notions of, who, you know, whose lives matter and like, that we, you know, that all, that all of us do. And so I, you know, I, I th I'm totally support this, that we, you know, find strategies. But I think, I also want to acknowledge what Jake said. I mean, we all have unique skill sets and unique things that we can contribute. 
and I think that we have to also recognize both what, what their potential is and what their limitations are. So uh, I make films and that's what I, I mean, it's, it's, I consider myself an artist. I'm not actually, I don't have um, a structural um, answer to how to, you know, solve these problems. I, I don't, I mean, but there are other people who do. What I'm trying to do is, is you know, um, the work that I do, which is, has its own kind of, um, you know, can achieve some things, but there are some things it can achieve. And maybe it can achieve, like, you maybe will care about somebody who you wouldn't have understood their circumstances before. That's not going to change the society. That's maybe going to change your, um, you know, your, how you understand the world a little bit. Well, maybe, I also kind of meant it in a way to the people who are coordinating the disruption lab as well, to, is it possible to, to include this kind of diversity in this setting? So maybe also if Tatiana could respond to that as well. So I, I have a, a thought about that, which is, I mean, one of the really unfortunate, I love how many cameras are in the room before I say this. Um, let me think, I need to choose my words very carefully, Pod, I'm sorry. Um, I work with some politically active Muslims and many people in this room also work with those politically active Muslims, but we exist in a world where merely associating yourself with some kinds of politically active Muslims uh, puts you in very serious danger of being charged with material support for terrorism and uh, other really nasty stuff. And if you are aware of what happened in the last seven days in the United Kingdom, you'll know that the British government is now just straight up killing people if they are perceived to be in any way associated with ISIS um, or a whole bunch of other groups. And one thing that's really terrifying is that it has a chilling effect, which is anybody who's a Muslim is only one degree away from that. And it's really absolutely unbelievably terrifying. But there is support then, and, and, and I think there actually is work that's being done to help to empower people who are part of an oppressed minority, actually. Um, I mean, this is a pretty white panel. I mean, I have a Jewish last name, but let's just say that we're all white on this panel for the sake of argument. Um, but part of the problem is that some of those people, they can't get here, and some of those people wouldn't want to be associated with us. I mean, we're like, the surveillance Christmas tree, you know? Like, you don't want to be talking on this panel with us if you're actually in an area where there are active drone strikes. I mean, obviously, I think we should work to give people like that a voice, but I think the other thing we have to do is remember that sometimes when people have a voice in those areas, they don't have the privilege of staying alive once they've used it. So we have to be very, very careful about that. And in order to do that, we need to build, I think, uh, infrastructures for resistance that make it much harder to carry out those kinds of, for example, literal political assassinations, right? The United Kingdom is assassinating its own citizens right now. That happened. They killed two people in the last two weeks, right? They killed a guy who's like a script kitty computer hacker. He's like not even, like it's not even noteworthy the stuff that he's done. And they were like, oh, one of ISIS's top hackers. So they killed him. I mean, I think ISIS is a pretty, is pretty disgusting. It's as bad as Christians that go invade the Middle East for the sake of spreading their God. I'm super not interested in neo-crusaders either. At the same time, these are people and they're being murdered by states that are, they're, the, the, they're supposed to uphold the rule of law. They're supposed to care about the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. So while it's great to be inclusive, let's remember that we can say this stuff because she's an Oscar award winner, I think, you know, that's, that's part of that protection and not everybody has that. I mean, we should work to, to change that, but I do think it's important to remember that that's, a, that's serious. Like there's a guy from Gaza who came to the Chaos Communications camp and he works on 3D printing, uh, he works on 3D printing limbs to be able to like help people have prosthetics. And I think it'd be great to have him here, but I also think that at some point he's gotta go back to Gaza. And so the question is like, how do we deal with that? Like what kind of political support could we offer as a society or as uh, people in societies from all around the world? Like how do we actually manifest that support so that he doesn't like suffer unjustly, uh, you know, or be like horribly interrogated or have something worse happen to him? So we have to, I think we have to be very cognizant about the real power dynamics and for some people the very serious consequences that will come their way. No, and actually I also want to respond to you because uh, we really tried to have somebody coming here from Gaza. This was the event that we did uh, last uh, April. The 17th, 18th of April was about uh, drones. And uh, so we, have really, we had really great people here and we really tried hard to have two women from Gaza that could also speak about the drone wars. One is uh, Asma Argul and the other is Eba Retzek and we actually were not able at the end to ever he have them here because now to leave Gaza, you can only have permission from Israel. 
And so, I mean, of course, there are all the bureaucracy that uh, you have to go through, but also there is the fact that Asma, for example, in a black, is in a blacklist because she is also a journalist that is reporting on these uh, issues. And so what we did in that specific event was also to ask uh, Asma to send us a video contribute. And this video contribute you can actually find on our Disruption Lab website. So I totally agree with Jake that it's really important to invite also these people, but sometimes it's completely difficult to get them here. And uh, so we had like a, a collaboration and sort of uh, dialogue with them for almost one month, and at the end, there was no way to make them come here. It works? Yes, it does. Hello, everybody. Um, so, I'm here. <laughs> I basically have a ton of, uh, of questions, but I will just ask two or three. Uh, <laughs> so, um, this the first assumption is I really appreciate you, but the point is it's very easy to make a good question. It's very hard to make a criticism to people that you appreciate. So the first two questions maybe sound like critic. Please prove me wrong. So does um, it may be that the, 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 the hacking and the whistleblowing is more of a personal uh, approach to struggles and not uh, and not a political universal approach. I mean, it can be harmful sometimes, and it, it's it it also may be easier for someone to make a whistleblowing and then disappear uh, instead of joining a real movement. And or it's easier to speak out and write in the newspaper and then go back home instead of joining a demonstration in the street. Uh, this is, it may be harmful, it may, it may be just selfish to stay home and do this, or just say, I provide instruments, you do your business, you do the clashes in the streets, <laughs> you, you, you use obscure cam to, to take photos during the demonstration, and blah, blah, blah. I hope this is clear. Then a more technical question, but it's also kind of critical. Um, uh, recently, WikiLeaks, released uh, all the um, hacking team uh, documents, uh, RCS um, software company uh, from Milan. It's a, a company that produces target instruments to, to, to control, it's a targetized instrument to control activists or people and was selling it all over the world. There was this big hack and instead of providing the documents to uh, single newspapers, to journalists, to create a personal, as you did yourself, you, to create a personal contact between the leak, the, the, who, the, the guy who did the leak, and a source, a filter. There was no filter, so everybody was able to get directly what they wanted from this data. So there was, like hackers were looking for other hackers that were working for this company, or I don't know, in Colombia, people were looking for documents regarding Colombia. What, how does the filter affect the, um, the view um, of, of, and how this, this goes out to the, to the masses? Because journalists always have some filters in mind. If you are from US, you're, you regard, I, I stop here, you understood. Um, and also the last question, I promise, uh, the, um, how, how, how easy is to communicate uh, highly technical issues to, let's say, the masses. How, do you use metaphors? How, because in Italy we had this leak about um, hacking team, but many other leaks concerning Italy as well, but nobody cares. There are big struggles, but on, on other topics. Nobody really understands what they're reading, if they're reading it. So how do you engage uh, real communication with masses? That's it, sorry. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, answer to your first question. And I think um, one assumption that kind of um, underlies what you're saying is that the real hard politics, that's going on the streets. And uh, it's kind of a lazy kind of political action if you're just a, a hacker or you're just a whistleblower. And I think that's an utterly wrong perception because 
um, the penalties and the risk that hackers are taking are much higher than going to a demonstration, even though I'm not devaluing uh, demonstrations at all, that's not what I want to say, but I'm saying hacking and whistleblowing is not a cheap kind of politics. And, uh, but what I actually, maybe and you hinted to that um, as well, and I wanted to, to pick that up, is that um, I think it's a problem that um, hacking as a political practice is very isolated among a certain community, and that people who are outside of that community can share their thoughts with this community, and there's still a, a lot of boundaries between hackers and general society, and I think that is something um, that we should change. And one of the problems uh, is maybe um, somehow linked to what you addressed in the third questions, because I think that um, it is a real issue that our media literacy uh, about the things, the devices that we use is getting lower and lower the more we use technologies. We know less and less. So this gap between a very techni uh, savvy community and uh, society is getting bigger. And to, to um, talk about different kind of politics is getting harder and harder because the understanding between um, general society and this very um, yeah, technique heavy community is drifting apart in a way. So um, this other question that you addressed in your last statement, that the no one cares question, I wonder if that is only um, a result of little, the little knowledge that people have about technologies and about how surveillance works. Um, for me, like working on this also as a philosopher, I, th I, I have the intuition that there's something more be behind that nobody cares. And for me, the interesting question is like, why don't we care? Like, is it, I think being free and enjoying freedom is something actually very hard. You have to take on responsibility, you have to inform yourself, you have to gather knowledge to understand all the, those political things going on. So um, on the other side, I believe we are so used to being controlled and giving responsibilities to systems that control us that maybe it's the easier choice. So it's, it's just um, theories by now. So it's uh, just, yeah. I think it's a very important question that we need to ask, like why does most of the society not care? And I think it's not only that there is a gap between the technical knowledge and these techniques. I, I would actually just say that people actually do care, and uh, I'd like a citation for your people not caring, because I think that most people just don't understand how to show their caring in a modern world, and it's very difficult, and so we can just sum it up as people care or don't care, but that's not a database discussion, right? I mean, I tend to think that when each individual person is asked about it, it depends on how you ask them, but they, 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 didn't, they actually do tend to care, even though like hacking team stuff, when you explain this is a company that sold the equivalent of weapons to the Sudan that was being investigated by the United Nations and they violated well, countless laws, and by the way, they signed their emails with fascist quotes, do you care? Often people say, well, yeah, actually, I do care about that. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's also true that some people care and they support it, right? I mean, well, no, I think you don't see it, which is different than it not existing, right? And that's what I'm trying to say is that we, we need to have a way, I mean, everybody in this room doesn't care. I mean, like, I mean, like how do we measure those things? How do we know what we know? And how do we know what we don't know? So I, I kind of feel like, actually, a lot of people care if you, like, measure, for example, the number of people that downloaded the hacking team data through BitTorrent. You see all these people who were seeding the data, like, it was one of the most seeded torrents on the internet during that period of time, I think, like in terms of political discourse, there are not a lot of things that were as politically relevant and like people really joining in. I personally know someone who spent like thousands and thousands of euros on bandwidth personally just to make sure the files were available. Uh, lots of people that went into it. So in my view, actually like, you know, hundreds of people that I was directly talking to on a regular basis, they were dedicating all of their time to it. So my perception of that was the exact opposite, actually, that people really cared about it. And, uh, and in fact, I, a couple of people, uh, Morgan Mayhem and, and uh, Claudio Garnetti, these um, two researchers who work with the Citizen Lab, they have for years cared so much about it that it's been a major part of their research. 
And in fact, they've published many reports and then this hacking team release actually vindicated their research and showed that hacking team was in the countries where they said they were and they'd independently found that. So I think there are people that care so much they make it almost a full-time job to care about it. Um, and so, you know, don't denigrate their work by saying that your selection bias is the truth. Um, I'll answer quickly. I sorry mean, to be so I, harsh about that. But um, not, not, not too sorry. I, I, I think they're really interesting questions. I mean, in the, in the first one, I mean, I think that uh, individual action versus joining social movement, I think there's a question of like, what is the, what motivates you to do anything? And I don't think it's an either or kind of a situation. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's like you have a menu and you say, oh, I want to take, I'll take the whistleblower and I'll take, the, you know, I mean, people uh, like you're put in situations that, that you respond to. And, and I think that, um, you know, as, as a filmmaker, I don't, I don't make films for outside. I mean, I wanted, like I said at the beginning, that they're, they're kind of trying to express something about humanity. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. And they're not necessarily having an end goal that's, be, you know, that's, it, is, it is an act of trying to communicate. And that's kind of what the goal is. And then if it has an impact beyond that, that's great. And if it doesn't, you know, it's still trying to communicate. And so it is, in a sense, an individual um, um, action and but I also believe in you know social movements and other forms of how do you, you don't we don't create change alone obviously and then the filtering question I mean this is you know I think it's it's I mean a lot of things go into it so for me personally it's the question of um, both what do I feel in terms of what do I like with an obligation or what do I feel like that I feel comfortable publishing or not there's that one factor there's another factor of what a source communicated in terms of what they felt was public interest it comes in. But I also have huge respect for, you know, what the work that, that Julian and WikiLeaks have done and like how that opens up a space where more people can engage with the information and come up with things that aren't that aren't going through filters of, of journalists. And I think that um, Hey now, come hmm? on. I mean WikiLeaks is a filter for journalists. It's just journalists who are willing to be exiled or journalists who are willing sure. to be stuck in an asylum right. situation in the Ecuadorian okay. embassy. Well, but that was my, going to be my last. That then, then you also have to factor in the risk and, and what risks, you know, so whatever, the combination of all those things and what risks. Um, and uh, and I, all those things are sort of part of, of, of a decision of what you publish in the end. The, the hacking team person is a perfect example of someone who I think is absolutely amazing. I actually hope it's a collective of people posing as a man. I, myself, I, I think it would be great if it was a collective of like female hackers from the Arab world striking back at the fucking fascists that run that, that company. But who knows what it is? But the, the, the fact of the matter is that they decided to release, or he or she or whatever, decided to release this in the way that they did and that's in a sense like that's what a source's decision. Although in this case, it's like that was a very conscious political action. And so to sort of like call it out like, like it is, sometimes people take political actions like that and they do it differently. For example, Jeremy Hammond is in prison for 10 years to speak to Teresa's point about the costs. I mean, there's a fetish from the left, especially in Europe, about being in the streets protesting. And like, I also love to watch people fight with the police in the street, for sure. There's, and there's a catharsis in being tear gassed, I'm sure, that you know, we can all agree feels like you know, some great morning. But at the same time, you know, there's a huge high cost for someone like a Jeremy Hammond who did hacking for a specific political outcome and he has been in prison for it. And there are people like Tim Jenkins who were jailed in the Pretoria jail until he amazingly broke out, but I mean, there's a, huge, uh, there's a huge cost to that. And that filter is a choice that different people make, right? Like the, the Citizens Con uh, Committee to Investigate the FBI that broke into the media Pennsylvania office and leaked documents uh, to the press. I mean, they chose to do that in a different way. And in, in each set of people making these decisions, they're, they're often very politically conscious about it and it gives them different political steps later to take. Like Snowden can, uh, basically, I think, have a very different response than, say, the, the people that hack hacking team or whoever hacked that, the Gamma Group PR people. Um, and they're, they're very different uh, in how they choose to approach it, right? Like, Jeremy Hammond is the same way. He's, I would say, much more, um, he was more overt about those things. And I feel like Snowden really positions himself as a moderate by giving documents to Glenn and Laura and then stepping out of the process. That's a very different, that's a very different uh, process. But I think it's good that people have a range of choices about that, and I'm actually happy to see that there's a diversity, essentially, of tactics of publication. Uh, I personally favor the hacking team uh, hack publication process because it allows everybody to be a journalist. 
every person that downloads that BitTorrent and reads through it and then says something about it is committing an act of journalism. I really like that. Because people say, how do we scale the reporting? And the answer is really easy. You involve other people. Um, the difference, though, is that the journalists don't want to become the sources. So they can't scale it in the same way that the, the hacking team people or whoever hacked hacking team can, can do that. Um, and I think that WikiLeaks actually sits in the middle there where someone wants an intermediary, but they also want an intermediary that's not worried about being Im imprisoned, for example. And they're really willing to go out. But WikiLeaks is the publisher of last resort, so that's a, you know, that's a very different uh, thing. And it requires different sources, right? They're, that's actually the, the big problem, is finding people that are willing to, to actually p put out more information. But... Uh, I think that if you have something to say, you should use the microphone. The microphone, <laughs> but also, but I also think that maybe we should pass the question to somebody else. And by the way, I also would like to add something uh, that I think that is not one practice exclude the other. So I totally agree. And I'm actually coming from Italy as well. And I don't think uh, I mean to Italy is the total example of also how hacker practice could be really combined with politics uh, and also with. Uh, uh, a network of people that are producing uh, activist projects. And for example, tomorrow we will have Jaro Mail speaking here, and I think he can really tell a lot about that. So I also totally see the matter as that, uh, you know, it's great you go on the streets, but you can also hack. Or you, there are several practices that you can combine. Yeah, just one a small addition to that. Um, I think protest usually goes where the music plays, to put it in a picture. And I think that for certain things going wrong, demonstrating would just not be an efficient technique to achieve something. So with civil disobedience is not combined to a certain practice. It's a concept that is reinvented with the issues that it fights against. So all the new practices emerge because of a constellation and the context. So um, there is a big difference. Um, people who hack usually feel that that's the only way they can achieve something. Yeah. So next question. Hi. I mean, I also think that Hi, the, different, the different methods of protest, I mean, that you have different kind of uh, I think we see technological changes that then open a space for people to interject into the power structures that be in a different kind of way that creates a disruption. And then there's a readjustment. So an example of that would be the sort of the, the, the first time where we saw the, um, uh, televisions go out and film war, and once those were being broadcast, then we're like, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to have embedded journalists. And so now we have a very contained representation of war that's very, you know, very removed rather than um, very immediate. And, and I think we see, you know, n now this sort of moment with the, with the internet, which allows people to do, to, to um, I think, be more disruptive in terms of what the, the you know, the existing power. But then what do, what do we, see, what are we going to see in 10 years? I don't know. I mean, I hope it's not what we see, you know, in terms of mainstream cable news coverage, in terms of what we, what's possible in terms of action and protest. I mean, just to make one, I guess, final point about the individual. I think it's important uh, not to fetishize the individual, but I also think it's important not to forget how much an individual can affect something. Tim Jenkins, uh, who Sophie will talk about tomorrow, I mean, like, that's a super exciting uh, person in my mind because I feel that he single-handedly, through the communication systems he built, brought about the end of apartheid by being a part of a larger movement, right? Being a part of the African National Congress, being a part of Umkantu Wee Sizwi, uh, the, the armed wing of the ANC, the militant wing. Um, I feel like he, by building a communications network and helping people to communicate, uh, really, as an individual, took some very specific actions, paid very high price for that. He lived in exile for a long time. He went to prison for that. Um, at the same time, what he did is he enabled a larger movement. So I think you do need a larger movement, but you need to not do that at the cost of forgetting about individual action. So, for example, in, in tactics and strategies for resistance, if we were to get concrete about it, it would be a very radical action if anyone that's in this room that's never been associated with any of us, hopefully you didn't bring a cell phone, nobody knows you're here, you're not on a video, go join the police. <laughs> Arrest General Alexander when he comes to Europe next. Go join the intelligence service. Don't do a long walk through the institution. Do a short walk. 
right? The long walk, you know, the long walk through the institution that the 68ers in Germany did, in some ways they succeeded and in some ways they failed. And if we look at Snowden, he didn't do it for the whole of his life, he did it for 10 years, and at the end of the 10 years he changed the world more than any other person in the history of intelligence and whistleblowing, period. And what that requires is a strong belief. In his case, he cared about the Constitution, cared about something being wrong. He was able to take an asymmetric action. So look for all the structures that you find to be unjust, and then there may be some places where you might be able to do something. Like, that's not for me. That's, I've solidified in my life that I have to do journalistic stuff or artistic stuff. I'm never gonna be like uh, in that space. But there are people that can go into those spaces, and if that's what matters, I think there's very specific actions that are super subversive that actually make the whole world very different, and they need to be done by uh, individuals because there's an operational security component to being alone, which is that you don't have to worry about somebody talking, and you don't have to worry about somebody blowing uh, that apart. You don't have to worry about somebody arresting you. You don't have to worry about that stuff in the same way that if you work with two or five people or if you're a part of a bigger movement, actually. And we shouldn't forget that. The, the natural operational security of a family, for example, is very different than if you have a group where people have economic concerns where they might be uh, blackmailed or otherwise harmed. So I think there's very specific things that individuals can do, and it takes a long time to see how that will play out for each person, but there's a great cost, and so we need to have a mass movement that will support those people, and at the same time, it can't just be those people in isolation. I guess I really did say go be, be a cop, uh, but I meant it uh, in a nice way. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd also, well, I mean, to sort of contradict, I mean, that when we think of the whistleblowers that we've talked about on this, every, every, each of them entered these institutions believing in those institutions. Just, I just, you know, that should be noted. I mean, so there's a big difference between a Bill Binney, uh, there's a difference between a Bill Binney and an Ed Snowden, of course, and what I'm suggesting. But what I'm suggesting is, I don't believe these institutions are good. I don't believe that structures are good like this. And, and, and so I think if you also don't agree with that, instead of tilting at the windmill, burn the fucking windmill to the ground. And there's a good way to do that. You just have to find the weak point in the windmill and you have to light it on fire, metaphorically and nonviolently. But you have, to, you have to do that if that's what you wanna do, not doing it ineffectively. If you're in the institution and you really believe in it, that's something separate, and I think disillusionment will come. The question is whether or not courage comes with it. And some people, they actually want to make structural change, and they're, they're dying for a particular structural change to be made, and I think that, that it exists. There are always weak points in systems, and especially in unjust systems. For example, if we want to show drone warfare as being terrible, what we need to do is get more of the videos that show them targeting women and children. People care about that, and when you show that, it shows these guys to be cold motherfuckers killing women and children. And that's like, even, even if they're Muslim women and children, even in the West, people care about that. And I'm, I would like to say that we should care about all of those people. But I mean, I, like, I actually don't want to play by the same rules that, I mean, that the power structure. So for instance, when I was in Iraq, I wasn't going to carry a gun. I mean, I don't want to, if that means that I'm less safe because I'm not carrying a gun, then I'd rather live in, uh, that, in, that I'm not carrying a gun, nor do I want to infiltrate institutions, I, personally. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you need, you, need, you need multiple, I'm glad we have this, this tension. We always have, Laura and I always have some tension, so I'm glad that we could share that with you uh, and the video archive of the eternity. Um, I agree. I don't, I don't think you should go and carry a gun there, but I do think that there's, um, there's something to be said about the fact that if your goal is to do the disruption, if your goal is to stop, for example, extrajudicial murders, I'm not saying you should become like the people committing the murders. I'm saying you should expose the facts that show the people for what they really are, and that you need a, you need a diversity of tactics. And one of the things that needs to be done is you need a documentary filmmaker that's willing to just go in and, and play ball and be in their space, and that's what you've done. And, and the stuff you did in Iraq, it's amazing that they let you into those rooms to film. At the same time, you need Chelsea Manning, and you need people who saw what happened to Chelsea Manning and don't have a delusional loyalty to a military that assassinates people without a trial and does it allegedly for the two of us so that we can be free in some way, which is just a bunch of horseshit. And I think we, we, we should actually infiltrate organizations the way that the, the, the secret police infiltrate the rest of our lives, but we should do it with a particular understanding, with a particular goal, so that it can be done actually with some integrity and it can be done to get a specific outcome. And I know that we... Well, I mean, I just like it's a, it's a, it's, I, I, I would argue that, that, that the, maybe the takeaway or maybe that's your perspective, but I don't think that I'm, I mean, there's huge risk in if, you're, if you're advocating for people to infiltrate organizations, and that's not, I wouldn't advocate for anyone to take that kind of a risk.
Yeah, well, I think the, the point that I'm saying is that I think that's a tactic that might work. And I think every person has to decide on their own what happens. But I think if you see something that's wrong and you don't act, it, it is really, really the case that it, it conditions us to continue to accept that injustice and, in fact, in some cases, to become a part of it. And so I think if you're going to be the kind of person who is able to join those organizations and you really care passionately about it, you can make a very different... Uh, impact, and I think in some cases a very good impact. Uh, obviously we won't completely agree about it, but, uh, but I do think it's important to note that this diversity of tactics is actually a part of how historical change occurs. When you have members of the police or the military defect, especially in a revolutionary situation, like in South Africa, when you have people that were defecting from that, it actually turned the tables. It meant that you were able to see the other side. And in fact, it humanizes both sides of this. And so in the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa, you see actually that it went too far. You see that members of MK were planting and doing like really extremely dangerous stuff and they ended up killing civilians and likewise the apartheid government killed civilians. I'm not advocating becoming the mirror image, just resisting, but I'm suggesting that with the structural analysis, if the goal is to tear down something like an apartheid state, or the goal is to stop an extrajudicial assassination team, that you can't pat yourself on the back for trying. You have to succeed. And success requires sacrifice in some cases. And I think that that is what Teresa was saying when she says it's different to do hacking and to face 10 years in jail than to be on the streets. It's not enough to dance to music and protest against Merkel doing a thing. We've got to shut Rammstein Rams Air Force Base down from doing drone strikes. That's like the meaningful goal. It's also nice to do the rest of the stuff, but we must not forget that the purpose is to stop the executions in some cases. And that's something which is easy uh, to forget, actually, because it feels good to protest in the street. Yeah, Hi. But I would argue, like, aren't there other tactics? Like, for instance, if you wanted to shut down Rammstein, for ask instance. Can a question that might relate yeah, to So, this? for example, how would you do that? Well, I would say, what, what does it rely on? It relies on the, you know, the electrical grid, the power, you know, I would say like... And yeah, now turn. we're getting somewhere. Let's get into that. <laughs> right? I mean, there's actually, there's, a, there's an action to try to, uh, so the NSA data center that's in Utah, they built it in Utah, which is a desert, and it requires a tremendous amount of water. And so then the citizens were like, oh, well, you know, that's not okay, that so much water is going there. So they're actually trying to create, say that this is illegal, that they're using so much water as a way, and that's sort of like with working within the system and tactics to sort of try to create change without infiltrating organizations. Yeah, I mean, for sure, um, reformist policies sometimes work, and sometimes they don't, it depends. And if you're in Gaza, for example, reformist policies probably look like supporting the oppressor that bombs you. I mean, it just depends on how dire the situation is. We, we live in a position of privilege, everyone in this room, to some extent, really compared to the Gaza, situation is in a position of privilege. So I think that that's the point is that, I, I mean, if we look at Gene Sharp's From Dictatorship to Democracy, he lists all these different tactics, everything from like painting signs uh, to singing songs to, uh, you know, not picking up the phone to a general strike. He like details all these different things. And I think that it's good to study those things. And then it's also good to carry out the ones that you feel comfortable about. And I do think that, that especially when it comes to something uh, like computer hacking or whistleblowing, those are actually tactics that only a few people can undertake, but we have to look at broad solutions that everyone can undertake. And marching in the streets is only one thing, and it's one that is very easy uh, for people to do, and it has, in some cases, a low cost, but it also depends on the societal context in South Africa or in Iran. Marching in the streets is actually not a low cost activity. Um, it's an extremely high cost activity. And so you ha we have to think about it in a very dynamic way to be able to recognize where the impact is. So like when, when um, uh, Politische Schönheit has their, you know, the uh, Totenkommen, I think was the name of it in German, yeah. Die Totenkommen. I mean, that's, uh, from what I understood about this, I mean, that is an extremely tense situation with, uh, with the police and that it was a really upsetting thing, but it was very meaningful. Uh, and so I don't mean to disparage that at all. I think in that case, street protest and street theater actually did change some of the debate, and now we see the refugee discussion um, in a whole new light, actually. And it's really amazing to see that. And I think a big part of that was, in fact, protest in the street. But it was also that people took their own lives into their hands to try to escape their situation, right? I think it was uh, said something along the lines of, you never put your children on a boat on water unless it's safer than land. And uh, I think that that, you know, that suggests that there's a, there's a, there's a tide, so to speak. I think there was also another question on the audience, and we are 
also almost out of time, so I would say Hi. something. First, I wanted to ask you if you have something to comment on this, because I know you have. <laughs> and then uh, we will take another question from the audience. Um, yeah, I'm not so very convinced of this idea, infiltrating organizations, but maybe for another reason, because I think it's generally against the nature of people to start out giving you a lifetime to an organization that you don't believe in or that you just want to prove wrong or infiltrate. And I think that is generally a good thing, that people want to believe in the systems they are part of. And I think it's also a necessary thing because collective action in organization only works when we stay by the same rules and work together. But I think this can also take off and become a disbalance and I think that is what's happening very often is that people put their organizations, the companies they work for, over their personal ethics. And what, what happens is that they go along and stay under the radar with things they don't even commit to. I don't think that everybody working in these organizations is by nature a bad person. I think they're simply putting the ideals and the, the benefits of an organization over their personal ethics. And I think, as a philosopher, I would argue we have to change that culture. We have to change that culture of just going along in this kind of co-conspiracy because we are putting an organizational model over personal ethics. And um, to, make, to give a more um, relative um, notion to this personal ethics thing in the discourse about civil disobedience, that's actually a quite important point, that even though an individual could act uh, and do something that we can um, see as civil disobedience, but the interesting part is if he does that for his own interest, for his own benefit, or if he does that for a common good and with, a, with an interest that benefits society. And that is the big difference, I think. So an action could actually be very collective, and I think Snowden is a very good example. All, everything he did was not at all for his own benefit. I think that is quite obvious. So even though he was a single person doing that, it was a very collective thing that he had in mind. Okay, so next question, I would say the last one. Hi, I just wanted to ask uh, one question of everybody, um, and that, I guess, because there's a lot of talk about the U.S. and what is right or wrong for the U.S. to do or not do, and then there's, there's talk of the U.K., there's talk of China, and, and, and the, you're, you're having trouble with the state. The nation is the one that is fighting you to say, well, this is illegal, this is wrong, but is that the enemy? Are we, is, is each nation the enemy? Are, are you fighting this, the nation? Are you fighting an idea that it expands beyond that? Are you fighting corporations? I mean, what or who are you fighting? I w yeah, maybe you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, Dan Daniel Ellsberg, I think in his book Secrets, he talked about meeting an Indian woman during the uh, Vietnam War. India is in the country where Mahatma Gandhi is from. Not uh, Anyway, so, um, and he asked her about the concept of the enemy, and she said that in my culture, in my society, we don't have this concept of the enemy. And it's a very nice passage, which I won't butcher, but I'll just explain. I'm not fighting against a particular thing, I'm fighting for very specific things. And so the reason that I wanna take a structural approach is I don't think that uh, it matters if you have a drone strike agency, for example, if that's like a just drone strike agency. There's no just murder, ink, right? So for me, there are very specific things I'm trying to help create in the world. So with the work on WikiLeaks or with the work with the Tor project, Tor is about creating an infrastructure for all of us to have anonymity and traffic analysis resistance or to put it in a more meaningful sense, so that you can read whatever you want, so you can exercise your right to read, and so that you can speak freely. That's, that's the goal there, and there are lots of people that object to you having that right. And so for me, I wanna make sure that the infrastructure exists and that you can use it free of cost, and that you can verify that it works, as in free software, and that's what I'm fighting for with Tor, for example, and with WikiLeaks, I want scientific journalism to exist. I want you to have access to the original source documents so that when you read the article that I've written, you can see my filter. You can see my context, and you can write a different article based on the same documents, and if you give people that, that source information, then they can do the same. 
And so what I want to do is empower every person. I want to destroy the notion of a special access, to destroy the notion that only the rich should have privacy. Right? In this sense, I guess I'm kind of a populist, I guess, except I'm, maybe I'm not a populist, but I, I still want, I want these things. And that's not against something. I don't think the state is the enemy. I think the state doesn't exist. Right? I mean, I think that there are people that make up the state and they have some actions which are very, uh, I mean, they're very concerning at times. And I think we should work to mitigate those things. Um, I think that that's actually a very positive goal. It's not just a, a sort of cynical, we've got to smash the state sort of simplistic anarchist phrase, although I appreciate those too. Uh, it's really the case that I want to see a world where, for example, there are no more political assassinations. And, and I want to see a world where you have free speech. And I want to see a world where you can anonymously publish information without having to destroy your life if you have access to that information, where you can leak it to journalists, um, or you can do what the hacking team hacker did, which is leak it to the whole internet so that every person can become a journalist. And that, that's what I'm fighting for. And then in that, there are many things that I think we end up fighting against or that come after us. I mean, if you look, um, I think, for example, at Snowden, um, it's true that he did this for everybody, but I think you know there are people who take actions where they don't do it just for everybody, they also do it for themselves. I mean, South Africa, I'm sorry to return to that so often, but you know, like Nelson Mandela and the rest of the people that were arrested in the treason trial, uh, those are people who stopped using nonviolence and started to use violence because they lived in a world where they could be summarily executed by the apartheid state. And they did that because their own lives were on the line in addition to the lives of the brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and other people in this country of South Africa. And so I think it's important to, to, to consider that context and to work towards, for example, in their case, they work for a post-racial society. And I think that that was a wonderful thing that they were trying to work towards that goal. It wasn't just against the apartheid state. And having that as a big picture political goal, I think is important and at least I know that WikiLeaks is always often portrayed as an anti-secrecy organization, but that's just not true, right? It's not anti-secrecy. It's a specific asymmetric thing that gives you the information so that you can join exactly in having uh, an informed discussion. That's a, a huge difference between just being against secrecy and being about empowering you with that information. You become part of that as soon as you have the information. Um, I just wanted to add add one thing um, that that of, that of course there's no argument that what Edward Snowden did was uh, benefited our understanding. But I asked him directly, like, do you understand the risk you're taking? And he said, this is you know I'm doing this for actually personal reasons. He didn't want to live in a world in which he couldn't read and write freely, so he was doing it for something that he cared about and the world that he wanted to live in. Um, from my perspective. Um Neither the state or states nor companies are the enemy. But um, I would say there is definitely things that we should appreciate states for what they do for us. But on the same time, side, on the other side, there is ways of how, how companies and how states govern us that are unwanted. But both states and companies are not an end in itself. They should serve the self-determination about of people how they want to be governed. So criticizing that the state is applying ways of government that are unwanted does not necessarily criticize the state as an organization in general. But um, one other thought is that I do think that the state as an, um, a system now has its limits because we're living in a very connected world where we can connect our action to the action of others way across borders. So I do think, and I do think that is something that politicians are actually quite aware of today, that uh, the state as a concept is losing its grip in a way. But yeah, again, I would say both states and companies are never ends in itself, but serve people. So I was ready to close, but then Jack told me it would be so great if we can have another question. Mm -hmm. So actually, I want to know, do you want to also have a last question and then we finish? Oh, let's give uh, an opportunity of the last question, something really short, and then we close. There is a person over there. Oh, I, I stole the mic. I think, oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> can I? Oh. oh, I got a question. I've been waiting. Thank you. Okay, I'll take mine, <laughs> I'll take mine tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> 
I'm really curious, uh, thank you so much for you three like answering all these questions. I'm really curious of your perspectives as artists and philosophers and makers, um, how you think the information age is changing storytelling and what excites you most about the opportunities in the way that in this information is out there and how we can use it to tell better stories. I don't know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say let's. That that feels like a departure from the sort of the tone that we're in. And so I'm gonna. Even though I could answer that question, I'm gonna. Let's do another question. And it's. I think it's a good question. But I feel like in terms of where <laughs> yeah, the direction of the way. conversation, it feels a, a departure. All right. Then, then I'll, I'll I'll jump in here. Is it on? Yeah. Um, you kind of went into it, and hopefully we go further into it tomorrow. But. Um, Jake, you're always very inspiring and like egging us on to take more risks. But when it comes to the, the like the civil disobedience, I would like to hear more about what I see as the strength and also with like the FBI break in in the in the seventies. Like what made it possible was also uh, the the risk management in the end. Uh, basically, there they got away with it because there were too many. Uh, everyone was suspected of having done it because there was a huge movement. Uh, so they disappeared in this, for example. Or when it comes to civil disobedient acts, uh, you're also uh, distributing the risks by a, a huge number of people doing an action, that, and then, for example, standing up and taking the, the punishment and the legal system and the, the whole... Um, all the focus that is brought, the attention that is brought to it uh, makes it you can't uh, be so draconian in your punishment as you can be with the whistleblowers now that are singled out, that are... Every, the legal system can seemingly always say that, well, this is historically unique, so this person has to burn. And, like, how can you uh, use, yeah, the civil disobedience in a way... Um, in, in whistleblowing as into uh, distributing the risks or uh, collectively leaking or at least collectively finding the solidarity to have either lower the risk so that people feel empowered to take this risk um, or yeah, e either that you feel the solidarity or that you actually lower the risk because you can't pin it on, on one person. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I mean, talking specifically about the Citizens Committee to investigate the FBI, I mean, they took maximum risk. I mean, this was eight people who went in and stole these documents and, um, from the FBI and then distributed them to journalists. But the two, two of the main people were a married couple and they had two, two young children. And they didn't make the choice for one to go and the other one to sort of remain out. So, I mean, it was a pretty maximum risk that they took. But I think in that case, it's also how, whatever the sort of network of trust that none of them it spoke that revealed the, the um, you know, what, what they had done for so long and they were able to, um, to keep it secret. But, I mean, it was, it, I don't think that they, I don't think that they dispersed risk. I think they took on enormous risk. I, I would say that, um what, what Laura said is very accurate, and I think one of the important periods, uh, in a, at least I would say it was also happening in Europe at the same time, was that there was a mass action. There were many people doing many different things, and some of these things, it, we only know about them today. They're actually bigger conversation topics because we could finally have these people talk about them, right? Like in, in, in this case, um, the people that broke into the media Pennsylvania office um, they had to really keep it a secret for a very long time, except that they had existed in the very few actions they did. Um, I think that things like the Courage Foundation are very useful for helping with this and that we are starting to build institutions in civil society that are a little like less conservative than, for example, Amnesty International, which traditionally has supported people who are prisoners of conscience. But I think in the case of the Courage Foundation, they're trying to support people even if they're not already in prison which I think is a really powerful thing. And I think in some cases you simply can't reduce the risk. In some cases it, it, it actually takes some, there, there is a cost. I mean, and that cost is actually in some cases structural. So when Julian decided to be the editor in chief of WikiLeaks, he takes on what happens to an editor who makes those editorial decisions. And then part of what he actually suffers comes from what society allows him to suffer. Uh, in a sense. For example, you're not gonna see Alan Rusbridger in the Ecuadorian embassy seeking asylum anytime soon, and part of that is because he's a part of a different part of British society, for example. So, I mean, 
I don't mean to push people to be more extreme. Rather, I mean to actually push the sort of Overton window about what is considered as extreme. If the problem is that there are people that are taking, I mean, I'm really focused on assassination politics, but if there are people who are really doing assassinations, I, I think that there is almost no extreme response to that if you can stop it. I mean, I think that it's one of the most despicable things that a state does. Uh, and there are states that are doing it. And so I think that um, we should just think about what it is we want to see in this world and what we want to tolerate in that. And I think we should work and we can work to stop those things through some things which are less extreme. Like for example, I think if you make a documentary film that exposes that, that's, that's a lot of hard work and it can work to change that very much. I also think if you get someone like Brendan Bryant who um, you know, was a drone pilot and you get him to talk about it, that's obviously not infiltration, but getting uh, you know, a policeman to defect, so to speak, that makes a different kind of change and you need both of those things. And speaking to a broad audience, the point is that each person knows their own context very well. And so my encouragement is actually, in a sense, to ask someone to personalize that. What does that look like to you? What agency do you have? What role do you play in mass surveillance? Like someone in this room is a cop. Someone in this room is involved in monitoring and dealing with protesters. It would be great if they would defect. Someone in this room is willing to do that. It would be really great if they would be willing to undo that. And I think that that's a useful thing to actually undertake that. It is extreme because it is so rarely done. But if more people would do that, it would be much less extreme. And it would actually also help to change the systemic injustices that are taking place right now. Um, and I, of course, I say that from a position of privilege because I'm never going to be like that, obviously. But that said, other people have privilege that they would be able to take. Okay, now two microphones. Please just be one short, uh, tiny, we have really tiny like close. Yeah, yeah, just one tiny addition. I think one thing that would definitely lower the risks is an actually working whistleblower protection. And I think a lot of countries implement whistleblower protection, but the question is if it actually protects someone. Because what I understand from the studies that are done there, um, that is not really the case. So um, having that and driving forward a discussion about how can we protect whistleblowers and lower the risks is one important thing and organizations like the Whistleblower Network I think is another thing to create networks that uh, make whistleblowing a less lonely action. So I think now we close this wonderful panel. I really want to thank Laura Poitras, Teresa Zucker, and Jay Kappelbaum. I think it has been really great to have you here. So thank you very much. And also want to take the opportunity just to announce the panel of tomorrow that will start at 3 p.m. And we will, the title is uh, Summit's Data Strategies for Resistance. So we actually go on with this discussion. And we will have uh, Jorgen Johansen, Jaromil, and Sophie Tupin moderated the Valley uh, Dorjevic. And also we will conclude with the crypto party. So please bring your computer if you want to learn more about resisting surveillance. Thank you. Thank you.